Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to deliver my paper in English. Uh, I have just some quotations in German. Uh, before I start, I want to say that it's a pleasure to me to be here, and I'm really happy. Uh, I'm really thankful for this uh, invitation. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Dmitrieva. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is... Okay. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's okay. In my paper, I aim to show how three influential German thinkers, namely Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Johann Benjamin Erhard, and Friedrich Schiller, analyzed the principles of the French revolutionaries. In order to do this, I propose a comparative analysis of their texts in which the legitimacy of a revolution plays an important role. A further aim of my paper is that of showing why we can understand the proof of the legitimacy of a revolution in the analyzer's texts only by reference to the more general theory of freedom these three authors deal with in their works. In this respect, I want to show how the theoretical research on the concept of freedom serves as a precondition for the justification of a revolution and for the possibility of arguing for or against its legitimacy. In order to illustrate my thesis, first I will recall Kant's statement about the freedom of speech in his text on theory and praxis, we heard something about that today. Second, I will go towards Fichte's arguments concerning freedom of speech and freedom of thought in his reclamation of the freedom of thought from the princes of Europe who have either though suppressed it. And then I will connect Fichte's statements with Erhard's ideas on censorship in his writing on the right of the people to a revolution. Third, I will link the justification of the right to free expression of thought with the justification of the right of the people to a revolution. In order to shed some light on the foundational link between these two rights, the right uh, of free expression of thought and of free speech and the right of uh, revolution, I will refer to Fichte's positions in his contribution to the rectification of the public's judgment on the French Revolution. And I will then analyze Erhard's position in his pamphlet on the right of the people to a revolution. I will end my comparative analysis with a reference to Schiller, to Friedrich Schiller, and to his letters on the aesthetic education of men. Once I have referred to these three different approaches to the problem concerning the legitimacy of a revolution, I finally aim to show how we can properly understand the delineated theories on revolution only in the context of the author's reflections on the more general concept of freedom. So that is my thesis. My thesis is that uh, just if we, if we understand what these authors has, have to say on the concept of freedom, we can then understand how they are dealing with the problem of revolution. I start now with Kant, uh, and this will be, that will be a very short uh, part of my paper. In different passages of his works, Kant refers to the concept of freedom of thought and freedom of speech. Among others, in the best known answer to the question, what is enlightenment? And in his doctrine of virtue, um, of right, sorry. A further passage, which I will consider below, comes from the writing on the common say that may be correct in theory, but it is of no use in practice. Kant assesses there that a citizen must have, with the approval of the ruler himself, the authorization to make known publicly his opinions about what it is in the rural's arrangements that seems to him to be a wrong against the common world. For to assume that the head of state could never err or be ignorant of something 
would be to represent him as favorite with divine inspiration and raise it above humanity. This assumption points at a sort of equalitarian basis on Kant's proposal, which depends on every single human being's possibility to reach rational conclusions. From the possession of rationality in each single human being, the necessity of freedom of speech follows. Freedom of pen, Kant says, must be kept within the limits of esteem and love for the constitution within which one lives by the subject's liberal way of thinking, which the constitution itself instills in them. The pens, the pens themselves keep one another within these limits so that they do not lose their freedom. The pens themselves uh, have some particular properties. Uh, this property of the freedom of the pen makes it the sole palladium of the people's right. In Kant's argument, the communication between rational beings and, in particular, between intellectuals constitutes not only the limits of a respectful exchange of rational grounds, it is also a prerequisite for not losing freedom. Kant assesses that communicating with one another is a natural calling of humanity. This calling descends from the spirit of freedom itself. He wonders, how else could the government get the knowledge it requires for its own essential purpose than by letting the spirit of freedom, so worthy of respect in its origin and in its effects, express itself? Rational thought implies communication between rational beings. This communication on rational grounds, on rational grounds only, seems to let freedom of verbal expression become a prerequisite of the realization of rationality at all. In this way, only a free communication would realize the scope of rationality in human beings. Only that we are communicating uh, with each other, we can speak about a proper use uh, of reason and becoming rational being in a perfect way. While Kant does not overtly assess uh, a necessary intersubjectivity for the realization of freedom, Fichte defines clearly in his works what seems to be found also in Kant's reflection. Fichte considers enlightenment not only as an individual, but rather, moreover, as a collective struggle. As it is best known, in his definition of the human being in the foundation of the natural right in accordance with the principles of the Wissenschaftslehre, we read that a human being becomes a human being only among other human beings. Only among a plurality of human beings, it is possible to speak of a human being at all. The Mensch wird nur unter Menschen ein Mensch. Sollen überhaupt Menschen sein, so müssen mehrere sein. According to Fichte, the existence of the others, of our fellow human being, is the essential part of the grounding process of freedom and of rationality itself. The possibility of rationality constitutively presupposes the presence of more than one single rational being, and only intersubjectivity can show the way to rationality. Against this background, freedom of speech does not only correspond to freedom of thought, it is furthermore the substantial prerogative for becoming a perfectly realized rational being. And that is my thesis, there is a, a strong thesis, that we have, uh, in principle, some thoughts of Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre also already in the writings on revolution and in the writings on uh, the freedom of uh, thought. 
I argue that we can find a first move uh, in the reclamation. And according to my reading, Fichte's first political writings, the reclamation, together with the contribution to the rectification of the public judgment of the French Revolution, constitute an inseparable part of Fichte's architectonical system of philosophy of freedom as intersubjectivity. So, I argue that we can make sense of Fichte's earliest, more political writings only if we read them as a first attempt of dealing with the inescapable primacy of the practical and with the theoretical problem of freedom. In order to explain my thesis, let me consider some passages from the reclamation. In a similar way as in Kant's text, Fichte points out in the reclamation of the freedom of thought that for the realization of our personality, Persönlichkeit, the, that is, the realization of the rationality of a human being, the expression of our freedom in thought is as important as the expression of our freedom in willing. Just inasmuch as the human being is, in these two respects, free, it can say, I am. I am an autonomous being. That's a quotation. Die Äußerung der Freiheit im Denken ist ebenso wie die Äußerung derselben im Wollen inniger Bestandteil seiner Persönlichkeit, so der Persönlichkeit der Menschen. Ist die notwendige Bedingung, unter welcher allein er sagen kann, ich bin, bin selbstständiges Wesen. Fichte links freedom of thought with freedom in general, and furthermore, he assesses that only through freedom it is possible to refer to an I, to a self. Uh, that is why freedom of thought constitutes the grounding condition of the possibility of the existence of a free I at all, which is, respectively, the only condition of a free personality and consequently, of a perfectly realized human being. Freedom of thought grounds freedom in general and distinguishes the human being from all other beings and from animals in particular. Fichte further characterizes this freedom, which becomes real insofar as the human being does not obey any other law but the moral law. The autonomy assured by the moral law excludes the possibility for the human being to become another being's property. This also presupposes the difficulty for somebody to legislate on a human being's action. Es darf kein Fremder über ihn schalten. Er selbst, er selbst muss es nach Maßgabe des Gesetzes in ihm tun. Er ist frei und muss frei bleiben. Nichts darf ihm gebieten als dieses Gesetz in ihm, denn es ist sein alleiniges Gesetz. Und er widerspricht diesem Gesetz, wenn er sich ein anderes aufdringen lässt. Die Menschheit in ihm wird vernichtet und er zur Klasse der Tiere herabgewürdigt. Such a statement will become the central nucleus of Fichte's defense of the people's right to a revolution. However, in this case, Fichte's argument constitutes primarily the grounding point for his defense of freedom of thought. In fact, according to Fichte, the only possible realization of a human being depends on the obedience to the moral law. In order for this to be possible, each single hum human being, each single individual being, must express the moral law autonomously. Freedom of thought is indispensable for human freedom since only by thinking autonomously, that is, only by thinking by ourselves, we can also give us ourselves a law which we ought to respect. All other heteronymous laws remain only provisional laws. The very social contract constitutes a contradiction 
a contradiction for the possibility of cultivating our own personality as human being. In this way, freedom of thought points at a more fundamental freedom, which is the very freedom of self-determining ourselves as rational beings. I quote again from uh, the Denkfreiheitsschrift, Niemand darf seine Wahl, seine Richtung, seine Grenzen bestimmen als er selbst. Das Wesen der Vernunft strebt in das Unbegrenzte hinaus. Es ist Bestimmung seiner Vernunft, keine absolute Grenze anzuerkennen. Und dadurch wird sie erst Vernunft und er, der Mensch, dadurch erst ein vernünftiges, freies, selbstständiges Wesen. Ein Vertrag, durch welchen er sich eine solche Grenze setze, schieße so viel als ich will bis zu einem gewissen Punkt ein vernünftiges Wesen, sobald ich aber bei ihm angekommen sein werde, ein unvernünftiges Tier sein. The role of the state is that of supporting our search for self-realization, our self-realization as autonomous, as a rational being, of course. Um, this is the perfecting of our personality, which is the perfecting of our entity as rational beings. The scope of the state is just that of overcoming and abrogating itself. That is, uh, as soon as we arrived the moral status, we don't need any state anymore. That is the scope of, of our state, to abrogate itself. As soon as a people becomes the sum of perfectly moral individuals, these very people does not need a self-regulation as a juridical or political order anymore. The moral regulation is sufficient for regulating the people's life. A state, a state is there just provisionally, and its real scope is to let itself dissolve. Once the people gains the moral stage of autonomous self-legislation, it will not need any state's regulation anymore. Against this background, it is clear why Fichte can also derive even a right to a revolution from the freedom of thought and from the freedom of speech, which are the preconditions of a sane state. Nonetheless, revolution remains in this writing, the first writing I'm analyzing, only an unsatisfying solution. The best solution is slowly realized reform reform within the state. Sicherer ist langsames, aber sicheres Fortschreiten zur größeren Aufklärung und Verbesserung der Staatsverfassung. Fichte uses even stronger arguments to link the right of freedom of thought and speech with the right to revolution in his uh, contribution to the rectification of the public's judgment on the French Revolution. However, before dealing with the other texts of Fichte, I will go back to another writing, namely to the writing of uh, Erhard. Uh, maybe just some words to, uh, about Erhard. Johann Benjamin Erhard is a German physician from Nuremberg who becomes acquainted with Kant's philosophy in the 1790s in Jena through the lectures of Karl Leonhard Reinhold. And from the days of his permanence in the city, in Jena, remains in contact with Franz Paul Ebert's um, circle and Friedrich Schiller, discussing with them Kant's philosophy and its implication. Maybe it's important to say something about that because uh, at the end of the 18th century, the city of Vienna be uh, becomes a very important city for, uh, the, um, for the Kantian philosophy. Um, Reinhold is over there. Um, and he is teaching Kantian philosophy. Schiller goes to the city as well, uh, and uh, also Herbert, uh, an Austrian, uh, coming to the city as well and running the first Kantian circle in, um, in Klagenfurt. Uh, and there is a very prolific uh, 
life for the Kantian philosophy. And in this cycle, uh, Ehad comes and uh, tries to understand what uh, the people, the philosophers say about Kantian philosophy in Jena. Um, another important uh, information is that in the last years of the 18th century, between 1790s and June 1769, a huge number of writings on the topic freedom and justice are published in German. And almost all of them, even though they are dedicated to freedom and justice, justice almost all of them are dealing with the concept of revolution. So there is no word of revolution in the title, but they are all speaking about revolution in these uh, writings at the end of 18th century in Germany. Uh, this is why Ehart's book on the right on the people to a revolution is just one among many other similar works. However, Ehart's writing also constitutes a unicum. Its particularity depends on the theoretical approach to this topic from a singular Kantian perspective. Furthermore, another distinctive characteristic of Erhard's writing is the attempt of the author to subsume the right to a revolution under the idea of a human right, mentioned right. So uh, that's what Erhard say about the revolution, that revolution, revolution, is a human right, a Menschrecht. Um, in fact, he says that uh, a Menschrecht, a human right, is a right which no state other than an immoral one would deny to a knowledge. In order to explain why the right to a revolution is human right, Ehat first takes into account the right of free thought. In doing so, he seems to have in mind Fichte's argumentation in the mentioned reclamation. He writes, Insofern man nicht wissen kann, was jemand denkt, ist es unmöglich, sich eine Herrschaft über die Gedanken anzumaßen. Aber dies heißt auch nicht Denkfreiheit, sondern diese findet nur statt. Wenn ich meine Gedanken, ohne durch die Gesetze deswegen bedroht zu sein, frei heraussagen kann. So frei heraussagen kann. The idea of freedom of thought is connected with the idea of expression of our thoughts. I am able to think freely only if I can communicate my thoughts freely. This last freedom enables me to cultivate myself as a person, which is the most basic moral imperative expressed by reason. Only when I communicate my opinions, I am able to become a better, which is a more rational being. I even have a duty to change my opinion if somebody points me a better argument. Freedom of thought is enabled by the freedom of speech, which is in turn a necessary presupposition for the realization of the human being as a moral and a rational being. Gewissens und Denkfreiheit sind die notwendigen Bedingungen zur Aufklärung und die Aufklärung ist the Menschen Pflicht. Every single human being has a moral duty to cultivate its personality, Persönlichkeit. We should show personality, whatever we do. Zeige Persönlichkeit in allem, was du tust. This implies that we have the duty to act morally. This duty requires in turn that we recognize the rationality of the thoughts. However, this recognition is possible only if we can discuss the thoughts of our fellow human beings. This is Erhard's conclusion. In this way, Erhard crowns freedom of speech on the freedom of thought, and in turn, freedom of thought on the unalienable scope of every single rational human being, which is that of realizing its own autonomy and becoming free. As Fichte does, also Erhard thinks of freedom of thought in speech as unalienable human rights. From this presupposition, 
both Fichte and Erhard deduced the right of the people to a revolution from their right to free thought and speech. From this, I will now analyze the possible foundation of the right of revolution in the second part of my paper. And I will start considering Fichte's position in the, uh, in the writing on revolution. In this text, Fichte argues that the state does not possess any right to legislate on matters concerning human rights. And, in particular, the state does not have any right to legislate against human rights. What we saw to be valid for the freedom of thought and speech in the reclamation remains valid also in the writing on the French Revolution. The essential right to form a personality and in this way to become a free rational being must constitute the starting point for a legitimate laws the state enacts. Fichte compares the role of a juridical law and the one of the moral law and says, steht nämlich der Mensch als vernünftiges Wesen schlechthin und einzig unter dem Sittengesetz, so darf er unter keinem anderen stehen und kein Wesen darf es wagen, ihm ein anderes aufzulegen. The only proper legislation is the one descending from practical reason, that is, from the moral law. Das Sittengesetz der Vernunft geht die bürgerliche Gesetzgebung gar nichts an. Es ist ohne sie völlig vollendet. Und die Letztere tut etwas Überflüssiges und Schädliches, wenn sie ihm, dem Menschen, eine neue Sanktion geben will. In a perfectly moral community, as I said, there is no need of juridical right at all. The moral law gives human beings all legislation they need. The following questions. Ist eine Staatsverbindung, welche unabänderlich sei, nicht etwa widersprechend und unmöglich? Widerstreitet die Unabänderlichkeit irgendeiner Staatsverfassung nicht etwa der durchs Sittengesetz aufgestellten Bestimmung der Menschheit? These questions should be answered in the affirmative. In fact, Ficht Fichte als, wir haben ein Recht, vernünftige Wesen zu sein. Wir haben ein Recht, unsere Pflicht zu tun. Ich habe ein Recht, frei zu sein. Und meine Pflicht zu tun heißt nur, nichts darf, niemand hat ein Recht, mich daran zu hindern. Diese Unterscheidung ist um ihrer Folgen willen unendlich wichtig. Political freedom is the right not to recognize any law which one has not given oneself. However, the only law one can properly give oneself is that of being free, the law of cult cultivating oneself morally, the duty of a moralische Bildung. The cultivation of freedom is the only legitimate scope of the state. Once this goal is reached, the state is not needed anymore. In order for this scope to be reached, revolution can constitute not only a right, but also a moral duty of the people under many other duties. In a similar way, Erhard argues in his pamphlet on the right of the people to a revolution. There, he distinguishes between moral and juridical questions concerning law, for what concerns the right to a revolution, there is no possibility of appealing to juridical justifications, since no tribunal can judge of an act which would question the very existence of the tribunal itself. So that's what you said, so what Ryder said today as well. Therefore, the question about the right of a revolution is not a question of law, Recht, but rather a question of legitimacy, Recht, uh, Rechtmäßigkeit, which has to be solved from a moral perspective. Erhard argues that for a revolution to be legitimate, revolution itself has to be intended as an action depending on moral duty. In particular, a revolution is always a legitimate act if it amends an insult against human rights. This means that 
every time a human right is uh, under a certain um, uh, every time you have a menace for your human rights, you can also come to a revolution. That's the idea. Because the human rights, the human rights are the most important things. Uh, the human single individual has to reach in order for his personality to be realized. The justification of the people's right to a revolution brings us back to the previous analysis of the foundation of a right to free thought and free speech as fundamental human rights. We remember, each individual human being has a moral duty to become a rational human being. It has a moral duty to never deny its own personality and to always realize its freedom. A law that hinders the human being in this undertaking is an illegitimate one. From this, Herald's conclusion follows, unter einer Revolution des Volks ließe sich nichts anderes denken, als dass sich das Volk durch Gewalt in die Rechte der Mündigkeit einzusetzen und das rechtliche Verhältnis zwischen sich und dem Vornehmen aufzuheben suchte. Through a revolution, a people obeys only to itself and aims to realize the scope of the Enlightenment, wishing to enter in the state of maturity and abandoning the coercion of a not autonomously imposed constraint. The legitimacy of a revolution is based on a purely moral duty. This, is a pri this a priori foundation finds also a further proof of its appropriateness, according to Eha, in the empirical manifestation of the revolution, which testifies of its moral vocation when a people acts anonymous against the prevarication of a faultly governing state. Das Volk kann, wenn es einstimmig handelt, nur von der moralischen Natur des Menschen oder vom Gefühl für Recht ausgehen. Erhard's conclusions are more radical than Fichte's one. Erhard does not only overtly defend the revolution as a moral mission, which establishes the legitimacy of the right itself. Furthermore, he points at the history for finding the legitimacy of the revolution itself. What Fichte does not manifestly express become now in Erhard's argument a fundamental human right. And now in order to conclude my comparative analysis, I aim to refer to the last position, namely Schiller's ideas on the revolution expressed in the letters on the aesthetic uh, education of man. In doing so, I propose an alternative theoretical approach to the possible foundation of the legitimacy of the people's right to revolution. In the aesthetic letters, um, first written as actual letters to his patron, Friedrich Christian von Augustenburg, Schiller tries to accomplish several goals. Uh, he criticizes the idea of enlightenment, searches for a transcendental account of the concept of beauty, gives a variegated view of the human psychological mechanism. However, what is most important here is that he delivers an account of the philosophical basis of the French Revolution and points at a new ideal form of government. Against this background, Schiller proposes to replace the political revolution with a revolution of the way of perceiving. The revolution a people has to work for is an interior revolution, a revolution of the human character. Schiller's diagnosis of the French Revolution is a very negative one. Instead of a, a Jacobin way of dealing with reality, he advocates a new form of revolt, which is a reactionary form of revol revolt. Schiller mentions the word revolution in the last letter and says uh, that, he, so he mentioned it for the sake of praising the action of the French revolutionaries, uh, but also to condemn and ironically abrogate the violence revolutions bring with them. He proposes another idea of revolution which has the scope of funding an aesthetic state. Es darf einer totalen Revolution in der ganzen Empfindungsweise des Menschen 
ohne welche er auch nicht einmal auf dem Wege zum Ideal sich befinden würde. Wo wir Spuren einer uninteressierten freien Schätzung des reinen Scheins entdecken, da können wir auf eine solche Umwälzung seiner Natur und den eigentlichen Anfang der Menschheit in ihm schließen. Spuren dieser Art finden sich aber wirklich schon in den ersten hohen Versuchen, die er zur Verschönerung, das ist die Idee von Schiller, die er zur Verschönerung seines Daseins macht. Not the constitution of a new state, but rather a new way of sensing the reality allows the human being to reach the real idea of the humanity. The cultivation of the capacity for a beautification, a beautification, Verschönerung of the world helps human beings to reach this ideal. The ideal in question does not consist in the perfect realization of the human being's pure rationality, which the Enlightenment gives itself as its scope. These ideals consist instead in the perfect realization of the completeness of the human being, not only a rational being, but also at the same time a sensible being. And we can do that in then in that we try to understand our world in a different way, in that we can try to understand the world in which we live uh, in another way, in, in, in that we struggle for the embellishment of the world. I have now reached the end of my analysis. <laughs> in order to complete my relation, I just want to emphasize again why I believe that we can properly understand the outlining theories on revolution only in the context of the more general reflections of the concept of freedom of the mentioned authors. What I suggest is particularly evident in Fichte's work. In the analyzed texts, Fichte derives the right to revolution from the duty expressed by the moral law. However, he assesses that the moral law, the solemn, corresponds to the original form of the self. Fichte derives the Sollen from a form of Andersein können, and in this way he refers to human freedom as distinctive characteristic which gives reason to the distinction between humanity and nature. The law of morals descends from ourself. Von woher denken wir denn nun dieses Gesetz zu nehmen? Wo denken wir es aufzufinden? Ohne Zweifel in unserem Selbst in der reinen, ursprünglichen Form des Selbst, in unserem Selbst, wie es ohne alle Erfahrung sein würde. Das Dasein dieses Gesetzes in uns als Tatsache führt uns demnach auf eine solche ursprüngliche Form. Ich wiederhole, ursprüngliche Form unseres Ich. We have a right to revolution because we have a right to be what we really are, our self. And this presupposition of the right to revolution is the presupposition of freedom as the characteristic of the self in its original form. Autonomy as the original form of the self, the chance, from this autonomy the chance the right to revolt. Fichte's metaphysics of the self is a presupposition of Ehrhardt's right to revolution, since only if the self consists in freedom, then it is possible to condemn, contend the existence of human right. Schiller, obviously, does not share this metaphysical background about the constitutive concept of rationality. According to him, rationality and the freedom, depending on the moral law, constitute only one part of the human being. But the sensible bar part plays also an equal influential role in human beings. The French Revolution, in this case for Schiller, is not an admissible move towards the realization of the whole humanity of human beings. So, thank you very much for your attention.
Ja. Thank you very much for the question. <coughs> so my aim was to show uh, how you can derive a, a right to revolution from uh, the essential uh, grounding freedom uh, of the concept, the grounding concept of freedom, which is freedom as autonomy, as you said. Uh, so that I was really thinking about uh, the possibility of dealing with the theoretical part of the philosophy of these authors uh, in order to understand why we come to a revolution like in Ehad and Fichte in a certain way and not in Schiller in the other way because there is a sort of, I don't like this word but I mentioned that, a sort of narrative um, like there is a, a dualism in Fichte and in Ehad about uh, the rational, the pure rational um, part uh, of the eye and the empirical part of the eye. And in Chile, it's not in this case uh, uh, important anymore because you have to try to realize both of these parts. In this case, if I want uh, to argue for my thesis, I would say that uh, the concept of inequality you are, men you are mentioning and the concept of uh, civil rights, etc., he is to be linked with this other part of the eye, or, or the eye of the self, of the person, which is the empirical one, you could say. So that um, I don't think it is possible, according to my reading, uh, to legitimate a revolution in order for particular civil rights to be uh, reached. On the other way, you can also say yes, but you have at the beginning the idea of freedom as a rational freedom, and this uh, also imply the possibility to arrive to different civil rights, which have to do with the reality we are living with in. So I mean, that's, they, they are, I think, just two different way of dealing with uh, the idea of self as a rational and at the same time sensible self, and from this presupposition, you can try to ground uh, the different uh, rights we are talking about. Um, I mean, I'm not uh, responding to you through uh, the text. I'm just trying to respond to you uh, according to my thesis, because it is important to me now, since <laughs> I want to argue for my thesis, um, to go towards uh, this idea. I don't know if you can live with it. <laughs> It was so convincing that <laughs>
Okay. Rather an observation. Your description of filter starts with the freedom of speech as a ground for freedom, as a ground for communicative rationality, as a ground for self -hood. This whole uh, idea of self being uh, constructed in rational discussion, free rational discussion, um, seems to create a link with uh, Habermas. Do you know, could, could you recommend how, how far, how Habermas in his people? Okay. The, the only thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the point is that so. I don't know if uh, Habermas have, has written Fichte, uh, maybe he did. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, the first important idea of intersubjectivity, uh, which is to be found not uh, only in these writings, but also, uh, most importantly, in the foundation of the natural right and in the system of the um, uh, in this case, there are other people in Germany, like uh, Honneth, Axel Honneth, um, who really uh, believe that uh, Fichte is uh, one of the most important uh, authors we have to read if we want to understand uh, how intersubjectivity works. Uh, so I would say that uh, if we are going to say in Frankfurt or in Germany, Hornet would be the most, uh, the closest uh, author to Fichte. Uh, he says that as well. Um, about the discussion in Habermas, I'm not that sure about that because um, in Fichte you have the intersubjectivity also for grounding uh, the I, not the, the rationality, but the I uh, as a whole which is more, so stronger kind of, I would say. Paradoxical. I'm, I mean, uh, it's clear. If the is the if the, the prince uh, suppress or if if the, the the one governing suppress the enlightenment, then you are not able to reach your autonomy, and that what the one governing wants from you or from from the people that you remain as you are, namely. <laughs> Not enlightenment. What was the paradox? So I, guess, yeah, I, I, to, well, I guess the paradox would be that um, the right to revolution is um, materializes at the point at which you haven't 
you're uh, prevented from reaching enlightenment. Okay. And yet, enlightenment is a necessary disposition for a revolution of truth, either be permissible or for actually working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But who is the one uh, struggling for uh, enlightenment? That's the individual. And uh, even though like, the people is not enlightened, so because just if the people is enlightened, then the people can start the revolution, uh, still uh, you as individual has the duty to become rational. And in a certain way, you can start yourself. You have to. It's your duty to start yourself. And then you communicate with the other. And afterwards, you can reach uh, your goal, namely that of being autonomous, not only as an individual, but also as a people. Yeah. I yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. The realization. Mm, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. We'll think about it. Thank you. <laughs> mm, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.